one of the biggest things that I've come to appreciate over this past year is the unique role that Acumen plays in our sector. Unique because we're an organization that's grounded in a set of values that's articulated in our manifesto. And by an organization that is based on values, and not values that we just wrote up on a wall, but values that we actually try to live by every day. And being grounded on those, with those values, it allows us to have the freedom, but also the discipline to focus on our mission. Our mission is to solve problems of poverty. And it allows us to see everything we do, our investments in companies, in leaders and ideas, simply as tools to solving these problems. So of course the question we ask ourselves every day is how do we know if we're succeeding? Well, I believe it's through our work in impact. Now last year at our partner gathering, I shared with you my aspirations for what I thought we could do with this work. And today I want to share a glimpse of how far we've come and what I think this means for us and also for the sector as a whole. Now I see two trends going on in impact investing right now. And the first is a real broadening of the definition of impact, so much so that nearly everything seems like it could be an impact investment. Now on one hand, this might be a good thing. The sector may be becoming more relevant to a mainstream conversation. Right? But the risk is that we dilute what it means to talk about impact. And for all of us in the room who are particularly concerned about questions of poverty, there's a risk that we marginalize the conversation on poverty in the context of a growing sector. The second thing that I'm seeing is there is, in fact, a lot more conversation about an acknowledgement that understanding impact is going to be important in the context of the sector. Indeed, there's a lot of new frameworks being developed. This is just one of many of them. They're pretty complex. But at the same time, what we actually see on the ground is that the practice of impact measurement has barely moved at all. And indeed, it feels sometimes to me like we're having the same conversations we were having five years ago, just with more people around the table. So I think that we're in a position fundamentally to change this, to have a breakthrough in the way we do this work and in so doing show the world what it means to have a real practice of impact that creates a new standard in the space and in so doing creates more transparency around where impact investing is or is not solving the problems of poverty. Now, my faith in the importance of this impact work and Tom and Jerez and, and others at Acumen and, is not widely necessarily, well, not, not widely shared, but I don't think it's universal. So just 10 days ago, I was meeting with this group of students from Haas, a group of Berkeley MBAs. They were in New York on a social impact track, and the very first question I got was, hey, we've been meeting with a lot of impact investors, and there seems to be a lot of disagreement about whether it even makes sense to measure impact. What do you think? <laughs> right? So this is from a group of students who want to make a career in this space. So in a lot of ways, I think we have our work cut out for us and a long way to go. Now, to be fair, it's understandable, right? The companies we are building are in resource-constrained environments. This is a photo taken of Gulu in northern Uganda. And if you're running a cash-strapped business that's trying to figure out its business model, it's really easy to see the work of uh, measuring impact as a nice-to-have in the context of these environments. But I'd like to argue that it is the farthest thing from it. And in fact, what I believe increasingly is that there is a fundamental alignment between the work of creating impact and understanding if you're succeeding, the work of creating value for customers, and if you are creating value for those customers, how are you creating value for the company? Namely, what I think is missing, though, is if you think across that equation, is the data that allows us to see those linkages, right? the data around who we are serving, where, how, and how much the products and services Acumen companies are delivering are in fact improving their lives. And then, of course, what the company can do to understand where they're creating impact, where they're not, and how they can make changes in the product that they're delivering such that they increase sales, they increase customer loyalty, and you start to have a virtuous cycle. So our framework for measuring impact used to be based primarily on measures of breadth. How many lives are we reaching? How many jobs are we creating? Of course, we still do that but we've been moving forward across these other two verticals. The depth of impact, how much are we actually improving well-being at the level of a household, and of course, who we're serving. Now, these are real questions that we have to answer. So something, for example, that's based on mobile technologies will spread really fast. The breadth of impact will often be baked into the business model, but how do we choose when we're allocating capital between something like that and maybe an investment in housing, 
which may only reach 500 or 1,000 people, but we hope could be transformational. These are the kinds of trade-offs we're trying to make every day, and of course, as an organization that's focused on poverty, it's incumbent upon us to understand if, in fact, we're reaching the poor. In moving our work forward this year, we've completely revamped our pre-investment process in a very deep and disciplined way, and we talked some about that this morning. And Tom uh, and Weiwei uh, and Rachel shared this morning a lot of detail on our Lean Data Initiative. I believe in many ways this is one of the biggest breakthroughs we've had over the course of the year. So the Lean Data Initiative, as simply as possible, is saying, can we take advantage of the new tools that are available? So mobile phones, tablets, SMS messages, but also the contact points that our companies are already having with their customers, call centers, sales, salespeople who are talking to them every day, and use that to gather real-time information about what, in fact, the company is delivering and the changes they're making in people's lives. So what does this look like in practice? So we came up with this idea earlier this year, um, and we reached out to Zakitsa, which is one of our biggest investments and most successful investments in India, and we asked them if we could pilot this Lean Data Initiative with them. We had never done it before. What we said to them was, look, for a company that is reaching, uh, receiving more than 3 million calls a year, has 1,250 ambulances across five states in India, and has an access for all model, they couldn't tell us who they were serving. They had some ideas, but they didn't have the data. And so we said to them, could we train some of your call center employees to ask 10 very simple questions from the Progress Out of Poverty Index that Grameen developed. And with the answers to those 10 questions, we think you'll actually have the data you want. They said, yes, we did the training. And just a month later, with no blip in company operations, no external surveyors, no researchers really involved, they had data for the first time that showed them what? One, 75% at least, and sometimes more, of their customers, in fact, are below the poverty line. So the company is, in fact, delivering on its mission of delivering access for all. Second, we got new data around who these customers are. So we discovered, pleasantly, um, that there's a disproportionate impact on women. And in fact, often, women are calling a Zakitsa ambulance when they're going into labor. And what we're seeing is that for people living in rural areas, Zakitsa is often the only access they have both to emergency transport and to train medical professionals. So the insights we're getting are really quite powerful. What the company is now beginning to do with this information is, again, using the data to understand where are they doing better, where are they doing worse, across different districts and then across different states. And not only are they acting on it, but you can imagine the impact for a founder and a CEO like Shweta, who was here um, last year, to say, look, for the first time, I actually knew we're delivering on our mission. And the energy and enthusiasm that her employees have to know that, to, you know, to Barry's points about a sense of purpose, is really profound. Not only that, but with the results of the study, literally within a month of its being published, they are taking it to the state governments to do at least two things. One is to say, in the areas where we're not, in fact, reaching the people we hope to meet, can we have more marketing support? Right? This is a, a private-public partnership that is working for the state, if you will. And secondly, you can imagine in what has become a quite competitive marketplace, how they can use this to strengthen their positioning if they are the only company in town that can say, this is the data we have really on who we're serving. It shows the commitment and it shows that they're delivering on the mission. So Lean Data with Zakitsa was hugely successful. We wanted to roll it out with more of our companies. So I'll give you just a second example. Asoko is a more recent investment of ours in Ghana. Now the idea of Asoko is again quite simple. How do we help smallholder farmers who are growing agricultural crops get better prices? Asoko wants to use the mobile phone to make this happen. So what they do is they send out uh, SMS messages to their customers to tell them prevailing prices. And as a customer, of course, then you can see how am I doing against the market price for a given crop. And the hope is that they'll fill this gap. So we followed a similar process with them. Again, it's very interesting. This is a company that's data rich. They have call centers. They're sending things out. But the loop is not being closed, right? They're sending the data in one direction. And we, how do we get it back? And so um, we worked with them to, again, do a, a set of questions around poverty, but also a set of questions around depth of impact, right? And so what we did is we trained them. We put out these surveys. The data we're getting back um, just now, so it's early days, but again, a huge validation of the business model. So 75% again below the poverty line. To give you a sense of the point of reference for this, 40% of rural Ghanaians are living in poverty. So they're actually over-serving their target market, um, which was hugely validating to them and to us. Secondly, we're starting to ask them questions around what are the actual prices people are receiving. So they, imagine this is a company that's sending out price information but never was getting the data back to say, well, here's the gap that we're able to identify between what we think is happening and what's actually happening. How is that gap closing? And more interesting still, how does that difference in how that gap closes differ 
for the crop you're growing, where you are geographically, and how poor you are. You can imagine the value of this data. Um, and we had the session earlier today, and I think it was Brad who said, have we thought about getting this data back to, co to, to the farmers, which we really hadn't done. And we would love to do to say, okay, how are you doing relative to your peers in the prices that you're getting? So again, imagine the, the power of this in, in terms of this company. So Mark Davies is the CEO of this company. He says, I believe that with addressing the information asymmetry, I can create value for these customers, but he had no data to prove it. Recently, Mark started speaking externally and internally to say, the purpose of Isoko from now forward is to deliver $150 of incremental income for every farmer every year. Right? So imagine what it means to not only be able to make a pledge like that, be able to manage your company with a focus on those sorts of goals. The next thing I'd say we're learning, in addition to that, this practice of impact really can move forward, is that it is n almost never a yes or no question. Are you having impact or are you not? Well, in some cases, it is a yes or no question. Uh, with something like Vision Spring, um, you know, a pair of eyeglasses, essentially, if someone is wearing glasses, they can see better, and if they're not, they cannot. But most of our investments, what we're learning, they're not like a pair of eyeglasses. They're like D-Light, and Don just shared the incredible progress D-Light has made. Now, we invested in D-Light for the same reason the company was founded, to eradicate the use of dirty, expensive, and dangerous kerosene. So in theory, you, uh, you sell a D-Light, and you're delivering on the mission. But what happens in practice? In practice, is sometimes you're succeeding, and sometimes you're not. In some households, they get a D-Light lantern, um, and they stop using kerosene. In others, they see it as a supplemental source of light. And 40 million lights in, 40 million people served um, for a company that has more than $20 million of revenues, the understanding that they have and we have of exactly how these dynamics work is not nearly as much as they or we would like. So we're excited to work with D-Light to actually uncover these dynamics. And again, the power in understanding the mechanic is when D-Light can understand what makes someone flip, is it the brightness of the light? Is it the characteristics of the light? All of a sudden, how do they adjust the product in such a way, again, to deliver more impact, Imagine the share of wallet that's freed up if kerosene spending isn't happening, and on and on and on. So hopefully, very powerful. I believe that this kind of work, it's just a glimpse from across the three of our companies. Um, but I hope it gives you a little bit of a taste of how if we can build the right data and the right systems, but in a way that aligns with how these companies actually work, we can move from our intuition and our gut about what it takes to solve these problems to real insights. And when I think about our work going forward around developing insights, I think they would come across on three different levels. So to take a step back, on the macro level, what have we really been talking about with lean data? Well, I think the fundamental question that's going on in our space, one of them at least, is can markets actually work for the poor? It's a question that we ask ourselves every day, and certainly we're more confident about it than many of our peers. But imagine, if you will, that you actually have data on where companies are and aren't serving the poor and how that differs by geography and by sector, my expectation is by the end of next year for all of the active companies in Acumen's portfolio, we will have poverty-focused data. And once we share that poverty-focused data with the sector and the tools that we're using and saying they're practical, they're cheap, you can use them too, my hope is that the level of transparency and accountability around where impact investing is and isn't serving the poor will move up radically. Of course, there's insights on the company level. I gave you one example. What features should a solar light have to actually eradicate kerosene? We hope to gather these insights across many companies in our portfolio. And perhaps the most important are the insights at a sector level. So one of the exciting announcements we have for today is the publication of a new report. It's literally going to press right now. You will all get a copy of the executive summary uh, in, your, in your bags on the way out. So two years ago, Acumen published the Blueprint to Scale report. Um, and since then, that report, what the report did was define this idea of a pioneer gap, the pioneer gap between a philanthropically backed company and the uh, impact investors are kind of lining up, waiting for something kind of at a very late stage. And so there was a gap a company needed to cross and helped Acumen understand and the sector as a whole understand that capital needed to be provided in that pioneer gap. Just to give you a sense of the, uh, of the impact that that report has had, earlier this year, there was a creation of a global innovation fund funded by USAID, DFID, uh, CEDA, Omidyar, with $200 million of capital designed specifically to fill the pioneer gap. Right? It's just one of many things that's going on where acumen ideas based on the work we're doing in our portfolio are moving money in the sector and are shaping that conversation. So my hope and my aspiration 
is that the Growing Prosperity Report will do the same thing, not looking at the sector level, but looking at the interaction between companies and customers. This report is, um, represents about a year's worth of work by Acumen and Bain and Company. They have been incredible partners to Acumen for many years, providing a huge value in terms of pro bono support to us on a strategy level. And we got the chance with them to really dig deep in our individual companies. And what the report is trying to understand is, again, imagine the potential in an agricultural market for something like drip irrigation, for something like hybrid seeds. There are all sorts of new innovations that exist in the world, but when you look empirically at what's going on, when people are trying to build pioneer firms around these products, is that it's very difficult for the firms to scale. The markets are disjointed, the soil quality is different, and word of mouth does not spread easily. And so what Growing Prosperity does is look at that uh, um, customer level of adoption of new products and looks at the company level of what are the sp specific things that pioneer firms that are trying to serve the poor need to do to actually get to scale. I believe that the report will again have that defining element of the next chapter of how to build these firms in this space. And I hope what it does really is serve as a playbook for companies that are interested in this work to say what does it actually take for them to move from blueprint to scale. I think that this kind of work going forward, these deep dives, to say Acumen really is a collection of assets around the world. And if we can study those assets in a really uh, profound way, we can understand first and foremost the impact we're having on the ground. right? And from that impact, we can drive our insights on the level of a company, on the level of a sector, and ultimately globally. And from that, what I think can happen is that these insights can drive ideas that will move others to act. Others, like the pioneer firms themselves, who are trying to find new ways to solve these problems. Other impact investors who are maybe on the fence about whether they can approach our part of the market, and we can give them the tools to do that. The major aid organizations, the DFIDs, the USAIDs of the world, who are increasingly looking to us and to our peers to say, how do they play in this space? And of course, global corporations who see the potential in these markets, see the value of Acumen as a partner, as we see in them. And, and increasingly, how do we, as an organization, take what it is we're learning, develop those insights, and use ideas as our leverage to really change the conversation and the practice in the space. So it's an exciting time, and uh, I think we're really moving, so thank you.